Hey, welcome to the show. I'm not in the garden today. I'm actually in a gardening office. The Gardening Australia office, to be precise. Hi, Chrissy. And I'm here to find out what are some of the team's favourite stories. And they've picked some crackers. Here's a taste of what's coming up. Jane dusts off the boots and hits Australia's most hallowed turf to see how much work goes into keeping it pitch perfect. Jerry explores an incredible collection of unusual plants and gets some tips for growing them. And we revisit one of Peter Cundall's last stories for Gardening Australia, and one of the most important. This is wonderful, and at the same time, it's extraordinarily moving, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Okay. You may remember in our 30th birthday episode how Millie and Squid showed you what goes on behind the scenes to make Gardening Australia happen. Every Gardening Australia story starts here with the research team. G'day, guys. G'day. Hi, Millie. They showed us lots of stuff, the production team hard at work to find the stories, camera and sound crews capturing those stories on location, and the producers hard at work to bring it all together with the aid of the editors and post-production team. As we saw from that last story, it all begins with the research. Helen, permission to enter the research hub? Permission granted, welcome. <laughs> now, how long have you been part of the research hub? About 12 months now. But your favourite story dates back to about 2015, yeah, is it? Yeah, that's right. So it's Jane in the daffodils at uh, Fitzroy Gardens. But you had a connection to it. I did. I actually was involved in the planting of the, the daffodils in the garden in my previous life with the City of Melbourne. And how many plants were actually involved in that project? 90,000 of them, Costa, were planted 90, by hand uh, by me and my team. We fed them, nurtured them, watered them, looked after them, and all of a sudden we had 90,000 babies. It was a, a beautiful project, and it's, it's great to revisit it. Yeah, let's check it out. Today I'm here at the Fitzroy Gardens where I'm seeing how the city of Melbourne is creating a flower-filled future. Last year I met Aaron Wood, who is chair of the city of Melbourne's environmental portfolio. Aaron and his team had created a living laboratory, a flower meadow smack bang in the heart of the city, filled with colour for bees and people to enjoy. The meadow was made up of summer flowering annuals, sown from seed to create an environmental oasis and a bold landscape designed to brighten people's days. I'm catching up with Aaron to find out about his latest project. Well, good morning, Aaron. Hi, Jane. Great to see you. Nice to see you on such a beautiful day and such excitement. Isn't it stunning? It's all oh. about bringing flowering meadows right into the heart of Melbourne. Well, you're certainly doing that. Have you got more? We've got more. Let's go take a look. Good. It really is a stunning display. Isn't it? It's just beautiful. Oh. It bursts out at you, this it colour. It does. It sort of hits you in the eye. Yeah. And I really like it how you've got the profile of Melbourne, the city, as a contrast. Yeah, right on the doorstep of such a built-up area. And this all came about because we were inspired by the Birrung Ma Meadow. It was just such a, a massive success and, you know, people taking selfies and social media. And we really, I guess, have been emboldened to try this right across the city and bring these flowers into the heart of, of Melbourne. Why choose the avenue with the elms? We had this blank canvas, really, because the, the drought that hit these beautiful elms so hard meant that we had to mulch under there to really retain that moisture. So what we were left with was these kind of, you know, dull areas under these beautiful elm trees, just a perfect place to plant these, these flowering meadows. So, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity and we've taken it. And how many have you got planted? We planted 10,000 in the first year to really trial it and it was a real success. Yeah. Now you've got 90,000 wow. uh, flowering How this year. How long did that take to, to plant out? Well, it was a real labour of love. So uh, there were six people who actually planted by hand every single one of those bulbs. It took them three weeks to actually put them all in. So real labour of love, but what a great result. 
And you've got a whole series of daffodils here that represent the early and the mid and the late flowering. Just a fantastic array of colour. And this is one that I really do like. That's called Accent, Narcissus Accent. It's pretty, isn't it, with the, uh, the Corolla that's pink. Really beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. I think, Jane, my 21-month-old would think a little fairy lived in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's perfect. Spring flowering bulbs really put a smile on my face. They are so joyous. If you've got a large amount of room, you can plant them and then let them naturalise. They will flower on and on for years. Don't worry though, if you've only got a small space, put them in pots, they're equally as good. Now in this day and age, the breeders are coming up with them amazing colours and amazing shapes. Have a look at this one. This is called Replete. See how it's a double? And it's an amazing thing. It looks a bit blousy to my way of thinking, but interesting. I haven't talked about fragrant daffodils and jonquils. This is a jonquil called Early Cheer. It is quite magnificent. If you pick a bunch of those, put them inside, the whole room fills up with fragrance. This is one of my favourites. It's called Narcissus Golden Lion, a true traditional daffodil, yellow with a wonderful single trumpet. But have a look at that. That really is a host of golden daffodils. It's called Mary Bohannon. Isn't that a corker? So Aaron, what is next? I'd love to see more of these meadows pop up right across Melbourne and we might have a wooded meadow planned for our next project. And is that more native inspired? Yeah, that is. And that's something that people are really excited about to see what we can do with natives. We've seen what we can do with these beautiful daffodil meadows. What can we do with, with our good old Australian natives? It is that thing of just bringing a little bit of joy into the city, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, on a, on a dull day, people are trudging into their workplace and, and they see this, this burst of colour and, and maybe that brightens their day. And I think that's great. And I want to hear what Melburnians want to see for their next project. What do they want to see in terms of the next meadow that we plant? That'd be a great thing to hear. So get in touch with you and on you go with the next one. I'm waiting by the phone, Jane, <laughs> ready to hear from them. I have been really inspired by this project and it's great because I've seen lots of people getting outdoors, seeing the beauty in the daffodils. So I'm going to take a selfie and I'm going to join in the conversation because it shows just how much flowers are important in a city. That is, if I can use this fangly dangly thing. Aha! <laughs> Now, Millie, what are some of your favourite stories? Well, I love them all, of course, but the stories that I love doing personally and seeing from the other presenters are often those practical little things that you learn. You watch someone do something differently to the way you do it and you go, oh, I've never thought of doing it that way. Simple. Simple. You know, like a tin can over a stake to help you bang it in. Don't want to hit myself with a hammer. Makes it a bit easier to do it. You know, you work out a shortcut and to be able to put it on the show and let other people see that shortcut. I mean, growing peas up my corn stalks, you know, it's a bit of a light bulb moment. I was about to pull them out and I think, hang on a second, what do I want to plant here? Living state. They need a frame, <laughs> you know, I'll leave it where it is. And I think, you know, that's the beauty of our show is we get to embed it with everything from really, really complex, high-end growers information right down to those fantastic little chunks of knowledge that'll make you a better gardener. You never stop learning from the garden. A really common problem people have with climbing plants is that they end up rushing to the top of the structure and you end up with bare bones below. There is a solution and it starts at planting. Now, temptation would be to encourage the plant to rush to the top of the frame, but then you'll just end up with that growth up the top. Instead, I'm going to train it horizontally. So I'm going to pick the two best stems and actually tie them down. You could even peg them down. I've done this by pegging them to the ground with some tent pegs. And a little bit like a spalier, what that does is it takes the energy out of a dominant bud and it actually shares it amongst all the buds along the stem, which means each of these stems will shoot, getting you nice coverage along the length of the fence. I'm just gonna remove some of this extra growth in the middle because I wanna push all that energy into those main stems. 
And as they grow away, these buds, I'm going to train them horizontally as well. And then I'm going to end up with great growth and coverage from the top to the bottom. This was a bit of a fun day. We're normally in a beautiful garden. And this where we've gone into a studio with green screens. It was a lot of fun. I mean, being in front of a green screen and then you instructing me to, you know, pretend I was sitting or lean on the wall or, or Great shot. point or, or call out. As a producer, you're always keen to make a bit of fun in the stories, aren't you? Yeah, I am. And when the researchers said, we've found this place called Cockington Green, which is a miniature village, I begged and pleaded to be able to direct this story because I just wanted a tiny little Costa running through this tiny little village. But really, at the end of the day, it's all about getting the idea across to the people at home. We don't work, do we? <laughs> we just play. Yeah, look, I want to get out and explore some more. Can you put me down? Sure. Good book. I'm at Cockington Green Gardens in Canberra, a place well known for its beautifully crafted miniature buildings and for the real reason of my visit. It's immaculately cared for gardens. Gardens that are cared for by five full-time gardeners who have the responsibility for the hundreds of different species of plants, as well as the 30,000 annuals they plant, well, annually. Time for the big world. Oh, need a bit of a stretch. Ah, that's better. Now, who can I talk to around here? Oh, there we go. Hello. Mark Sarah is the general manager of this family-run business. He's been involved since the beginning, helping his parents create this labour of love. My father always had an eye for detail and he loved gardens and gardening. He was a carpenter and builder. How did the concept for it come about? Came from a holiday to the UK that mum and dad and the family had. We saw a model village over there and mum and dad fell in love with the idea and they just thought, let's do it. It's given me pleasure for 37 years of working here. And you know, if, I, if you'd have said as a young bloke, would you, do you want to have a job for 37 years? I probably would have said, you're kidding me. The flowering annuals create borders and have a hedge-like effect, and the trees are meticulously pruned to keep them at the right scale. Everything about what you do is really geared towards replicating perfection in scale. But how do you achieve that through your species selection? It's, there's a lot of slow-growing and miniaturised plants on the market these days, and we target those. We use a lot of conifers because that's the main species that are great for us. The cryptomerias and things, they're so special in their winter colours and, and they're, they're a bit spiky, but they, they look great, you know, and there's, there's quite a lot. The book leaf varieties uh, prune up the trunks really well and have a really nice-looking trunk. I just love conifers all, all around, and particularly in this area, which is 112 scale. We didn't want the same old plants in every display, so we go for colour, leaf texture, just like you would at home, to get that variety in the displays, and, and we do that with our plant selections and choice. I'm really taken by the scale. You mentioned 112. Uh, are most of the displays one in 12? In this English area, they are. They're 112 scale, which is like a doll's house scale, if you like. And the, it's easier for us to hoard in here because the, the trees suit that scale better. To keep things looking ship shape, the trees need a really good prune, and some of them get it up to 10 times a year. Do you feel a kind of reverence when you're pruning some of the elder plants in the garden? I love the trees. The trees are beautiful. And there are trees out here that are 30-year-old specimen trees that are just beautiful. And so you feel a sense of responsibility to maintain the good looks of the trees and to keep them growing well for another 30 years or whatever. As a master pruner, are there any tips that you can share when it comes to pruning? I think the most important thing about pruning is to, to take your time, uh, 
step back on a regular basis and have a look and see how you're going because it's much easier to take more off than it is to put something on back on after you've made a mistake. I know you love your plants as a horticulturist, but what about these lawns? Yeah, well, I'm actually a greenkeeper by trade. That's where I started my horticultural journey. We tried to replicate the English countryside with a beautiful big belts of green pasture between the towns and communities, and that's what we're trying to capture with our fine lawns. We use bent grass, which is the type of grass used on golf greens and bowling greens in Canberra. It's designed to handle the cold and the frost and stay green all year round. As a master greenskeeper, what tips can you share with us? I think for the domestic garden, um, probably the best tips I can give are making sure that your ground's free of compaction, so getting the garden fork in there, loosening up the ground, making sure your moisture levels are nice and even, consistent, and also uh, fertilising, make sure that fertiliser gets into the soil. What's the story behind this pattern? So this is called a unicursal maze. It dates back to a Celtic time when they used it as a, as a religious symbol. It's, it's a maze that has a start and a finish and no dead ends. Mark, thanks for showing me around. This place is a real credit to you. Thanks, mate. It was lovely having you here. Yeah, look, I'd really like to explore a bit more. Can you put me down? Sure. Oh. Do you want a coffee? Excuse me, do you know where the community garden is? What about a Viking clap? Come on, everyone. Nice one. Do you take requests? Oh, great shot. Great shot. Hey, I'm here. Can you see me? Albert, as a producer, what do you love about your work? Well, I do gardening as my recreation, but I also do it as my profession. So for me, it's bringing the two together. It's a really, a really great position to be in. But was there a point where you became a gardener through the show? Absolutely, and I think, look, I'm a bit of a fanboy when I work with the presenters, especially Sophie. And so if I have, you know, things I'm working at my own garden, I've got the ear of presenters on location, which is probably a bit sneaky, but they're really generous with their advice. And when you're producing stories, is there a, a, a favourite between, you know, the practical or the more beautiful gardens? Well, I think I love seeing beautiful gardens, like everyone does, you know, because you, you want to get ideas and, and get inspired by them. But I think Sophie's place has both. I think she has that. But she also is very good at doing practical things. You know, she has a lot of in-depth knowledge about gardening, but also she's very good about constructing things and making things. And look, this next story is a perfect example of bringing the practical and creating beauty as well. I love looking around the garden and around the house, thinking of unique ways of displaying plants using recycled materials. My succulent frame is one project that I just love, and people are always asking how to make one, so that's what we're going to do today. Like any project, it's good to get all your materials ready at the start. And one of the great things about this is all these materials have been bought secondhand from op shops or salvage yards. Now, for a start, you need a good picture frame, a nice sturdy one, and one that's wood is perfect. I've got some chicken wire left over from another project. Down here, I've got some wood that's suitable for being outside and a piece of heavy duty plastic, or you can also use exterior ply. First off, attach the old chicken wire to the back of the frame using a staple gun. Then, the three pieces of wood that have been cut to size can be screwed to the frame, which creates some depth for the soil. Finally, put the back on to hold everything in. Once 
Once you've made your box, the next step is to block the top. Now this is only temporary because long term you need to actually be able to water from the top as well as the front. But in the short term we're going to fill this with potting soil and leave the plants to develop roots for the first month. So it actually needs to sit down. So the newspaper just stops the soil falling out. Now that it's full of soil, it's time to have some fun. And it's just a question of grabbing a wide variety of different coloured succulents. You can choose pieces like this, which I've taken cuttings of, or you can choose little rooted bits. The main thing is you get some diversity and you get ones that won't get too big. And then it's really simple. All we do is make a hole with a stake <laughs> and push the piece in. And the last step is just to water it in. How simple is that? Easy to make and it looks great. You need to leave it sitting flat for about a month so that the succulents develop roots, otherwise they'll fall out of your frame. And then you get to choose which wall you're gonna hang it on. And you'll have your very own piece of succulent art. Few stories have moved our GA team quite like this one from Peter Cundall's final episode when he revisited his former army headquarters up in Brisbane. This is a remarkable, inspiring and moving story. It's about a small group of men, all ex-Australian infantry soldiers, who are determined to remember and honour their mates who were killed in action or died on service overseas. So they created a special garden, a National Memorial Walk here at Nogra Barracks in Brisbane. All were members of the Royal Australian Regiment, formed just after World War II, and once every week they gather together to care for the memorial walk and by doing so, pay homage to their fallen comrades. Well, how long is the walk anyway? Oh, it's 700 metres long <laughs> and it's divided into operational areas. In so, what way? Well, where the regiment has served overseas and it has incurred deaths, then we've got an area for each of those. For example, we've got Japan up there, this is the Korean area here, and further down the walk we'll come to Malaya, mm -hmm. and we'll come to Sarawak, and we'll come to Vietnam, and more recently um, Somalia, and also for Afghanistan and Iraq and the Solomons. <laughs> so there are distinct areas that we operate in. While wandering through this memorial walk with Ted, I couldn't help but realise that these soldiers remembered here are still buried in Korea. What a marvellous way of showing our respect here in Australia. Well, the feature of uh, the memorial is that it is a living memorial. Now that means that we've got 693 plaques of deceased men and each plaque has a tree. Mm. And well, I'm looking at some of the plaques here and there's a lot of familiar names to me that I knew in Korea. And this is a bit of a shock in a way. This is Alf Barlow, he's my best mate. We both came out from Manchester together in 1950 and almost immediately was posted to the Korean War. And he was killed, what, probably about six to eight weeks before he was due to go home. And it is, well, it's an extraordinary feeling to be here. Mm. And what a magnificent way of remembering people like this. Yes. Well, we agree with you and we're very proud of the work that we do to keep the spirit alive. Mm. It's strange but true. Hardly a day goes by without thinking of your old mates, especially those who died. 
I'm looking at the size of some of these trees. I mean, how long have they been in? Well, some were originally here probably about 20 years ago, and they were just clumps. Yeah. But more recently, we started our plantings in um, 1995. Yeah. So we're now into what, what amounts to the 13th year of growth. Well, you've got a whole range. I mean, you've got the sea oaks here, which are marvellous because yes. they take very little looking after, and they're certainly a beautiful tree. Yes. And uh, you see here, here's another plaque. Uh, oh, another uh, Korean dear. veteran. Yeah, of course, Frank Johnson. It's interesting, another of my mates that came out uh, with me, he was killed virtually alongside me in the, in the Operation Commando. It was so sad, right, because, as you know, that in battle, you don't even stop, and he was just gasping his life away mm -hmm. as I ran yeah. past, and terrible yeah. business. And this is wonderful, and at the yeah. same time, it's extraordinarily moving, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Great thing. Well, Peter, this is the end of the walk. Well, it certainly is, and they've got a little message here right at the end. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land that they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. And that sums it up beautifully. I agree with you. Let me make one thing quite clear. This is not some glorification of war, because most soldiers who've been in active service, well, they really hate war. But what it is, it's a method of showing respect for those who sacrifice their lives for this country. It's as simple as that. Still to come on Gardening Australia, Josh goes wild, for flowers that is. Jane Edmondson sticks the booty. And Tino visits one of the only veggie gardens south of Tassie in Antarctica. Hey Pat, what are your favourite stories as a researcher? For me, my favourite stories are the ones where you're meeting someone who's such a character, who's, who's dedicated their life to something to do with plants. So this is where you do your propagation? It is, Jerry, uh, and, and a lot of cultivating. Um, and as and it for me, it's a really great part about the job where you get to call someone up and you say, you know, I've heard uh, that you're the top dog in whatever it is, bromeliads, aroids, tillandsias, something like that. I want to know why you're enthusiastic about these plants and the nation wants to know. And it's interesting, isn't it, because you're meeting people that, like you say, are, are the top, but then they're also, like, way deep. Exactly. Like, this is my world, that's what I live for. The colour, the colour. I walk down to where my bromeliads are and I've got a sea of colour. So that's the sort of thing that really gets me out of bed and gets me going for the day. I love them. They're not seeking fame, is the other great thing about them. They're just genuine people. They're completely dedicated, 100% into their thing. And sometimes they're not even aware that people would be interested in it. And then we get to take those people, put them on screen, and everyone just gets to sort of marvel at what incredible people these are. Yeah, decades of love. Exactly. And expertise. That's the other thing. Hello. I'm at Jacob's Well, and that's about 45 minutes south of Brisbane's CBD. Now, I've been invited here by a couple that really know a thing or two about propagation on a budget. Interested? Well, follow me. Jerry. Good to see you. <laughs> it's morning, I don't normally oh, like to tear it on us, but it's on its dirt. I, on their three quarters of a hectare block, Jenny and John have thousands of plants, many rare and unusual, and they've propagated them all themselves. I, I was supposed to get all prettied up for you. Welcome here, Jerry. Now that the weeding's <laughs> happened, I'm filthy. Oh, wow. This collection is huge. How would you describe your collection? Anything that will grow, that takes your attention, you'll start to collect. 
especially if you can get some results from growing it under these climatic conditions. But how would you describe this collection? An assorted nightmare. Well, but... yeah, but it's enjoyable. <laughs> An enjoyable nightmare. The collection is distinctly subtropical and includes a huge range of bromeliads, bulbs, aeroids and foliage plants. Jerry, they're dickias. Oh, they're lovely, From they? Brazil, and they'll stand three to four degrees of frost. Over there are your Alcantarias. Bill Marks here, I'd probably find those as an accent plant in landscaping. They're a wonderful luminous colour, aren't they? Yeah. Owen Burgia sells many eye. <laughs> That is a fantastic beast of a thing, isn't it? Everybody eh? knows us because of that plant. When we got wow. the pup, the pup was so large for our VW Combi, it stood out the back, Jerry, and the only way we yeah. could transport it, um, I made John take his pair of red knickers off and I tied it to the end. <laughs> and it went on. It, went it on had the been internet. growing so soft, the leaves were 12 feet <laughs> long. <laughs> now, you've got a reputation for growing Amorphophallus. Yes, we flowered one just recently and it drew the public's attention to the family and the plants. Amorphophallus are a group of warm climate bulbs much sought after by collectors. Each species has different patterns on its stalk. The rare Titanarum from Sumatra produces the largest compound flower of any plant in the world. The short-lived bloom is renowned for its odour of rotting flesh. If you could show me how to propagate them, I'd love to see. No worries. We're taking a leaf and cutting a artificial stem to the leaf by removing a portion of the leaf to get it down to the correct size. Down. And there. Wow. Put a very small amount of liquid hormone, which is on the bottom of the glass. Then you put it on the powder. Now, are they the same type of uh, hormone or are they two different types? No, they're the same type of hormone and they're that quick to do. So they're used to high humidity, yep. so they're sprayed. And that's a liquid seaweed. Oh, you're yep. using these little containers. Yep. yep. Fantastic. Oh. Now, you keep those, those tops on. They never come off. They never come off, so they must go in shade so they don't overheat. Yes, so. they do go in the okay. shade, not in the sun. The leaf dies off but leaves its energy stored in a small bulb at its base. The bulb produces new leaves the following season. So how long does it take to go from a cutting to some of these magnificent specimens you've got here? We've had that bulb for six years and the one that's flowered the beginning of this year, we believe it was about eight years of age. This place is really absorbing. You can feel the passion. One of the reasons why I have a passion for plants is it gets me out of the house and I don't have to do any housework. The real reason is they don't argue back. They sit there and do what they're told. Do not. Well, Jenny and John have certainly demonstrated that you don't need a lot of money in order to propagate a massive collection yourself. John's worked out that he's going to die in the year 2023, so we've still got 10 years of propagation left. I'll be very old, very cranky, but I'll still have my plants. Karen, there's no Gardening Australia without all the production coordination that you do. I mean, you can have it. I, I'd go mad. <laughs> What's a day involved for you? Uh, a day for me involves a lot of scheduling, a few phone calls, um, a, a, few. Lot of, a lot of juggling. I mean, I have to coordinate for about seven presenters, five producers, book crew for all their shoots, and on any given week I have about up to 12 shoots. But then yeah. you were also working against the Here. conditions. I have had researchers say, Karen, we've got a last minute shoot. And I ask them where exactly is it? And they'll go, we don't know, but we know these flowers are blooming at this particular time of the year. We just want to film it. The aim is just to make 
the shoot happen. Whatever I have to do to make it happen, I've just got to do it. Just like the wildflowers of Western Australia, you never know where they'll come up. This is Shunia Kasniana. As single flowers, they are delicate and exquisite. But when you get hundreds of thousands in bloom like this, it becomes one of nature's spectacular displays of fecundity and a bumper wildflower season in the West. I'm just outside Dalwollany, about 250 kilometres northeast of Perth. It's classic WA wheat sheep farming country and an area well known for its wildflowers. It's an ancient landscape that's been geologically stable for millennia. This, combined with the isolation, has led to incredible biodiversity. It's a tough and competitive life for plants around here, especially for the annuals, who need to make the most of limited water and work hard to attract pollinators. And it's this competition that makes them so showy. These are splendid everlastings, or Odantha chlorocephala splendida, a classic paper daisy. And like all of the flowering annuals through these parts that are broadly grouped as everlastings, they're like open country with plenty of sun. Now the seeds stay dormant in the soil over the dry summer months. They germinate with the autumn rains, grow over the winter and flower into spring. And when the season's been a good one, like it has this year, well, this is the result. This is Lechenotia macrantha, or wreath flower, and it's a bit of an iconic plant in these parts. Now it comes up after disturbed soil, which is why it's all thriving here alongside this road, and doing even better because of the stormwater runoff. Now it's a herbaceous perennial, and you can see how it gets its name, because the flowers are around the perimeter and they keep spreading out. And it flowers right through winter into spring, and it's an absolute stunner. With over 12,000 wildflower species throughout the region, it's a botanical feast. The areas are vast, so you do need to work to find the mass displays. But when you do, it's worth it. I reckon these shunias are, are just delightful, and what a treat to be up here at a time when they're looking at their absolute best. If you can't get up here yourself, don't worry, you can actually buy these seeds from specialist native nursery suppliers. In fact, you can get a number of everlasting species from nurseries, even in punnets and in pots. The tip is, make sure you mass plant them, because that's when they really look stunning. Jill, you wrangle this whole team. What are some of the stories that come over your desk that really resonate for you? Well, all sorts I love, but um, my favourite, they all tend to fall into one category, which is the ones that are, are slightly outside the box, the ones that push the boundaries a little bit. A great example of that would be the tattoo artist that we visited. You know, initially you, you would think, well, God, the Australia visiting a tattoo parlour? What, what, what's going on there? But then we see the exquisite native wildflowers that the tattoo artist draws, and you think, ah, oh, I get it. And it's it's that little element of surprise that that I enjoy. So my favourite that I've chosen falls into that category, and we actually first aired it on our very, very first Christmas special. And I know I wasn't the only one that, that loved it because we got a lot of very positive audience feedback from it. 
And with footy finals in the air, it's time to sit back and watch Jane Edmondson run onto the paddock. Go, Jane! <laughs> Edo, Edo, Edo. <laughs> That's right, I am standing on the hallowed turf of the MCG and any number of great sporting events have occurred right here. Like the famous centenary test when the legendary Dennis Lilly bowled Australia to victory. And that's it, it's LBW, Alan Knott is out. Lilly has struck again to finish off this test match. England all out for 417, another great... And in 1970, a record crowd of 121,000 saw Alex Jezelenko's soaring grab. Carlton overcame a massive half-time deficit to win one of the greatest grand finals of all time. And look at them, Bobby Barassi. And my word, what a proud man Barassi must be. In fact, I'm filming this part of the story just a few days before the AFL Grand Final. It really is very exciting. But I really want to see how this playing surface is kept in top nick so that the highest level of sport can be played here all year round. Tony Gordon is the MCC Arena's manager. He's been here for eight years. It's the most precious turf in all the country and it's a big responsibility and a lot of pressure at times. We are standing on the AstroTurf and there's the real natural grass. Correct. Why not use just artificial turf? The reason you wouldn't have an artificial surface in Australian sport is most of the time players aren't covered with enough padding or protection to prevent burns and um, the natural surface is just a much safer, more pleasant surface to play on. So what happens if the ground is too hard? What do you do? Uh, what we do normally is run a machine like this. So that's a pedestrian okay. aerator. It has some tines in the back and we can choose different size tines and different depths to have a different effect. And how do you test that? We use something called a Clegg hammer. It's a 2.5 kilo device, um, slides down, hits the surface and there's a sensor inside. It measures how, how firm the surface is. The MCG's tall stands offer a good view for spectators, but they cast long shadows in winter. There's parts of the ground, for example, where we're standing that haven't seen natural sunlight for about five months. So we have an artificial lighting system that we use to maintain the ground. Only one small version of the lights is on the ground at the moment. The main ones are stored under the grandstands. So we have 13 units. It takes about two hours to deploy them. But without those, this grass would just suffer and we'd end up replacing a lot of turf. What a great boss. The apprentice had to go on a coffee break, so Tony stepped in on the aerator. It's a good time to sneak in a kick. Outside the MCG, even though it's still footy season, preparation for a summer of cricket has already begun. The portable pitches are getting plenty of attention. The MCG is known for its classic pitches, and this is the reason. This is Merry Creek clay, and gardeners either like it or they loathe it. In winter, if it's boggy and wet, it really goes gluggy and hard to dig over. In summer, it does exactly the opposite. It dries out and it becomes like concrete. But here, it makes a perfect pitch. This stuff is horticultural film. It's acting as a blanket over the top of the little bits of cooch grass, the sprigs that are ready to bounce away in spring. Over winter, though, they need that little bit of covering because cooch grass might get bitten by frost. It's a perfect thing. It lets enough sunlight in so the plants do keep growing. Now, fast forward a week. The Tigers have won the grand final and the 10 portable pitchers are on the move. They're housed in steel containers, which can be picked up by a special mobile crane. Nearby roads are closed so the crane can move the precious pitchers into the arena. A 25 metre by 25 metre pad has been exposed for the pitchers to sit on. 
Despite the size of the crane, it can be manoeuvred to drop the pitches into position with millimetre perfect precision. Fast forward another month and you can see that the pitches are really greened up nicely. In fact, you can see where they were dropped in, those seams have joined up really well. I asked Melbourne Stars all-rounder Anna Lanning what cricketers look for in a pitch. Yeah, look, as a batter, you're looking for a hard pitch, um, little grass on it, just so um, you can make a lot of runs. Uh, as a bowler, you want a little bit of grass and um, so that it moves off the seam. And does that depend on the, like the Merry Creek clay, the soil, when, once it dries, it gets really hard and compact? Is that what happens? Yeah, that's it. You obviously want a really hard pitch. Um, you don't want it rolling or anything. You still want some nice bounce uh, for the bowlers and for the batters. Yeah. Gee, women's cricket's taken off. Yeah, absolutely. The last couple of years have just been amazing. The, the growth of, of women's cricket and the girls coming through that are playing um, under 10s, 12s and that sort of thing has just been amazing. Oh, that's great. Well, I, I had, was lucky enough to kick a goal last time I was on the MCG, whoopie do. This time I would love to turn my arm over to you. Would you mind? Yeah, you... absolutely. All right. So I've got it. some really devastating fast bowling <laughs> coming up. <laughs> Edmondson in, landing forward. Oh, she's had a go at that one. Oh, that's gone. That's gone. That's out of here. That's a six. I knew I should have stuck to footy. Anyway, one of those pitches will be used in the upcoming test on Boxing Day. And go the baggy green. Hello, editors. Hello, editors. Hello, 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 hello. Now, have you ever wondered what it looks like behind the camera on a Gardening Australia shoot? Well, here, have a look. Take one first for that. So what we might do is, how about we get Costa coming out of that greenhouse with a tray of seedlings? Uh, gimbal folder, take three. It's amazing the different gardens we get to visit in our day-to-day -day work, isn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, look at this one, community garden, freeway right there. But what a great use of the space. You know, and there are some really challenging locations. What about the maggot farmer? I mean, oh, his garden was yeah. in that box. Yeah, that's right. Remember, remember those maggots? We like had the camera, we had a close-up wide-angle lens camera, we had to try and stop them from wriggling around too much. And then they're there, and we're seeing them so close up, they're going, mah, 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 mah. and I mean, it was quite endearing, see? It was, I mean, people responded to that. Here we go. I feel like I'm panning for gold well, here. That's gold, that is really gold. Oh, look at them go. What about the guns we really want to get to, but we just can't, like Antarctica? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, so I had this idea, I'm just going to ring them up and ask. <laughs> so that was basically just ca called them. Just called them and emailed them. So we got them to basically um, show us how they grow their food, how they ate their food down there, all that fresh food. I mean, who doesn't love to eat fresh food? We all need it. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of those stories that is well and truly worth another look. On the driest, windiest and coldest continent in the world, a team of 16 Australians endure the harsh winter season to maintain the Australian Antarctic Division's Casey Station in preparation for the busy summer period of scientific visits. The conditions are extreme, not for the faint-hearted. But even in this southernmost place, there's a garden bringing sustenance and comfort. I'm here at the Hobart Wharf, and behind us is the icebreaker, the Aurora Australis. Now, Noel's in the process of resupplying the ship for their next trip down to Casey Station, which includes everything that the team needs to resupply their incredible hydroponic system. So, Noel, a lot of gardeners complain about, I suppose, their growing conditions. What's it like growing plants in Antarctica? Yeah, good question. Um, it's not really to provide a food source, although that seems a, seems a little ironic. It's, We've identified it's a great way to maintain morale for people on station, um, give them somewhere warm and, and humid, which is a pretty rare commodity in Antarctica, um, and just to yeah, get away from, from the sterile environment and get into a place that actually contains life and, and smells, like, smells like plants. How often do you get down there to actually resupply your hydro setup? 
Uh, each station gets a resupply once a year, which makes hydroponics even all the more important. What are the difficulties with growing down there? Power, heat, water. Sure, there's sunlight in the summer, but during the winter there's very little, so we have to provide supplementary lighting as well. We use expanded clay, perlite, but we also use rock wool, uh, particularly for raising seedlings. We have to abide by the Antarctic Treaty, which basically says you will not take any plants, fungi, bacteria, animals into Antarctica unless it's for the purpose of food. So our hydroponics has to abide by all of the guidelines under that treaty. The garden takes on even greater significance when you take into account the conditions down at Casey Station. Casey is located on a, on a rocky headland just at the margin of the huge East Antarctic ice sheet. It's uh, minus 20 here at Casey today. There's a little bit of a breeze which uh, takes it down to about minus 30 with the wind chill factor. Sometimes we can't go out of the building at all. Sometimes the wind is so strong it can get to over 200 kilometres an hour here. And at that time it's really good to know that everything's secure and that everyone is uh, safe and warm inside. In those extraordinary circumstances, self-sufficiency in growing food is not just important for nutrition, but for the spirit as well. Antarctica is an amazing place to spend time and there's not a lot I miss here apart from my family. One thing I do miss is green and growing things. Antarctica is beautiful and it's a lot of colours, not just white. It's never usually green. Growing anything in the harshest environment on the planet is a challenge. We have two 20-foot refrigerated containers which have been joined together for our grow rooms. And in those grow rooms between the two, we have 17 grow beds and four dedicated lettuce beds. Our main concern is to manage the water, so we want to maintain one litre of water a minute to the plants and that's to guarantee that the plants have a healthy source of oxygen. So there's been a lot of trial and error, a lot of winds, a lot of failings but it's been good fun and, and we get good produce and it's all working quite well now. Everyone enjoys fresh fruit and vegetables and I really think that this space is kind of lovely to come to with how cold and bleak and white it is outside even though it's very beautiful it's really nice to get into the green and, and be able to sit under these nice warm lights and and remember what the garden looks like at home. Some more yeah, much more less for you. This is awesome, guys. Like, this is what it's all about. It makes my life very happy down here when you guys give me this stuff. Obviously everything's um, dried or it's frozen, so any kind of leafy green vegetable or bright fresh tomato, just it saves my life. It really is um, very important, I think, down here. I think everyone appreciates it. Uh, it puts a beautiful finishing touches on the food, and thank God for the hydroponics. So the next time you think it's too hard or too cold to get out into your own patch, spare a thought for the expeditioners down at Casey and the challenges that they've had to overcome to produce fresh produce in Antarctica. Well, bon voyage, Aurora Australis. Safe journey south. How amazing is that? People really do work out how to grow everywhere. Now, we could keep sharing our favourite stories with you for months on end, but we've run out of time. Here's what you can get up to this weekend. Thank you.